Hello and welcome back to Financial Madness where we look at all things personal finance. In today's video we are going to be talking about how you can claim on your NHS pension when you are approaching retirement. So without further ado I'm Kozan from Financial Madness helping you be better with your money. Bow. So let's take a step back and regroup on when you can actually claim on your NHS pension. In the NHS, the age at which you can claim your NHS pension is known as the Normal Pension Age, or NPA, and this age varies depending on which scheme you are in. For the majority of you, you will be in the 2015 scheme, and the Normal Pension Age follows the State Pension Age, which, depending on what year you were born in, currently stands between 66 and 68. I'll leave a link below where you can find out your State Pension Age. If you are in the 2008 scheme, then your NPA is 65 years old, and if you are in the 1995 scheme, your NPA is 60 years old. Now, the NPA is the earliest age you can access your NHS pension without incurring a penalty. You can, of course, to choose to delay your retirement date if you want to, but the NPA is just the earliest you can claim without penalty. Now, I keep saying without penalty because you can claim earlier than this if you want to, and this is determined by the minimum pension age which currently stands at 55 years old and will be soon moving to 57 from April 2028. Once you have reached your minimum pension age, you can claim on your NHS pension, but you will incur a penalty for the early payout. And the amount of penalty you will be charged will be determined by how far you are from your NHS pension age when claiming. However, there is one thing that doesn't have a penalty, and that is a subscribe to this channel. So I hope that is all clear. So these are the normal pension ages which vary between schemes, which is the earliest you can claim your NHS pension without penalty. And this is the minimum pension age, which is the earliest you can actually claim, but if it's before your NPA, you will get a penalty. Now there are cases when you can of course claim before your NPA without a penalty, and that is if you become ill of health. And we will touch on how this works in the final part of this video. So leaving ill health to the side for now, there is actually two ways you can claim your NHS pension, and that is as an active member or a deferred member of the NHS pension. Now, depending on which category you fall under, it will determine how you claim your NHS pension. If you are an active member, you are a member who is currently contributing to their NHS pension scheme. And if you are a deferred member, you are a former member who is no longer contributing to the scheme, not eligible for a refund, and is currently not receiving their NHS pension. So how can you claim? Let's start off with if you are an active member. If you are a deferred member, head over to this timestamp instead. So first off is that you will need to get in touch with your NHS pension scheme administrator. This may be the NHS Business Service Authority, BSA, or your local pension officer. They will then provide you with the necessary forms and guidance to kickstart your pension claim. And they do advise that you do this process at least four months before your intended retirement date to best avoid any delays in your first payment. You will then be sent a retirement benefits claim form called AW8, and that should be completed as soon as possible. Let's go through this form quickly so you know what to expect. You can find a copy of the AW8 form online, which I'll link down below. Now there are certain parts that your employer will fill out, which according to this form that I have now, is between parts one to five, and therefore you only need to fill out part six to 14. Now, obviously, depending on when you're watching this video, this may differ from your actual form. So be sure to read the instructions carefully before filling it out. So if we go through your part, we can see that at part six, it is just simply details about yourself. Part seven is your employment details. And this is where you actually state your intended retirement date. Part eight is regarding allocating part of your pension. Now, this is a section you will want to pay particular attention to if you wish to give up part of your pension now to provide a pension to someone else, like a family member or a close friend, when you die. By proceeding with this, your pension will be reduced at retirement, and if you die before your beneficiary, they will then receive a part of your pension for life. Now be warned, there is no way to cancel this allocation once it has been agreed, so you can't recoup the pension that you gave up at a later date, even if the beneficiary dies before you. Part nine focuses on if you want to obtain a retirement lump sum. Again, you can claim up to 25% as a tax-free lump sum. You can specify the lump sum amount in the boxes provided. In part 10, this is about your status, so focusing on your marital status and any dependent children. Part 11 is regarding HMRC general information, so checking if you have any other pensions outside of the NHS and how much you can expect to earn at retirement, etc, etc. So this section does get a bit confusing and will probably require some additional guidance to help you fill this out. 
Fortunately enough, at the very end of this form, there are some additional details to help you fill in this section, as well as any other section on this form that you are struggling with. Part 12 focuses on your payment details. So how is the retirement money going to be paid to you? Part 13 is where you can list organizations or charities that you wish to make voluntary deductions straight from your pension. I'll link details below that provide more information on this. And finally, part 14 is your acknowledgement and declaration, followed by a witness to check everything and sign as well. Please do note that there is a criteria for who is eligible to be a witness. Once filled out, you should aim to return the form along with any supporting documents to your employer at least three months before your intended retirement date. The type of evidence that you will likely need to provide is your birth certificate and marriage or civil partnership certificates if applicable. Your employer will check your form as well as complete their own sections and there may be some back and forth with them as they may need more information from you or even evidence from you as well. If this does happen, make sure to respond as soon as possible to avoid delays. When your application is processed, you will receive a letter confirming your benefits and they will aim to pay your pension and lump sum, if applicable, within 30 days of your intended retirement date. And that is the retirement process for an active member. Now, if you are a deferred member, things are slightly different to the steps I just mentioned as an active member, but they are very similar nonetheless. So step one is that you will actually have to download and fill out the deferred benefits claim form called the AW8P form from their website. I'll drop a link down below so you can get a copy of your own. Once you have done that, you will need to fill the form in its entirety and return it to the address provided. Again, let's have a review of the form so you know what to expect. Again, it's worth remembering if at any point you do get stuck, there is a very useful FAQ slash guidance section at the end of the document to support you. So part one is where you have to provide details on your scheme membership number that is associated with your pension. Part two is key details about yourself and your marital status and if you have any dependent children. Part three is where you specify which type of pension you would like to claim and under which grounds. There is a possibility that multiple scenarios will apply, so make sure you tick all the things that are applicable. Now, depending on your selection, you will have to fill out a specific section on section three, as well as specifying when you would like your deferred pension to begin. Part four is your HMRC information. So checking if you have any other pensions outside of the NHS, how much you can expect to earn at retirement, et cetera, et cetera. As I said earlier, this section does get a bit confusing and will possibly require some additional guidance to help you fill this out. This is where the guidance at the end of the document can help you out here. Part five, again, is regarding allocating part of your pension. Now, this is a section you'll want to pay particular attention to if you wish to give up part of your pension now to provide a pension to someone else, like a family member or a close friend when you die. By proceeding with this, your pension will be reduced at retirement. And if you die before your beneficiary does, they will get a part of your pension for life. Now, it is important to note that there is no way to cancel this allocation once it has been agreed. So you can't get a recoup of your pension benefits at a later date, even if your beneficiary dies before you. Part six is where you specify your employment details and confirm if you are currently working for the NHS pension or not. Part seven is your payment details. So how is the retirement money going to be paid to you? And finally, part eight is your acknowledgement and declarations followed by getting a witness to check everything and sign as well. And again, there is a criteria for who is eligible to be a witness. So once you have done all of that, you'll need to send off your form by post with any certificates attached. Once again, this is likely going to be evidence regarding your birth certificate and marriage and civil partnership certificates too. The address you need to send it to can be found on the form itself, so worth checking it in case it changes for the future. You want to have it sent off at least three months before your intended retirement date. During this period, your application will be checked and they may reach out to you for further information and evidence if needed. And once again, if they do request any of this, please make sure you resolve these as soon as possible to avoid any potential delays. When your application is processed, you will receive a letter in the post confirming your benefits and who to contact if you have any further queries. You can expect your pension and lump sum to be paid within the 30 days of your retirement date once you do receive this letter. And that is the process of how to apply to the NHS pension if you are a deferred member. And finally, we look at how you can apply to access your NHS pension early due to ill health. Now to qualify for this, you must be leaving work solely because of permanent ill health. 
if you are dismissed for any other reason, you will not be able to qualify for ill health pension. Now, there are actually two types of ill health, or what they call as tiers of ill health retirement, and which benefits you get will be dependent on which tier you fall under, which is mostly looking at if you are capable of undertaking employment elsewhere outside of the NHS. Now, this video isn't going to go through what qualifies as ill health, but rather focus on how to apply for it. However, if this is a topic you would like me to explore in more detail, do let me know in the comment section down below. I will be linking some useful resources that go into ill health in a bit more detail in the comment section down below, so do check that out. So first off, to apply for ill health pension, you do have to get in touch with the NHS pension team and let them know that you believe you qualify. The decision on whether this is granted to you is based on a medical assessment that the NHS pension will organize with their medical professional team. To kickstart this process, you, your employer, and the occupational health doctor who will be doing the assessment will have to fill out this AW33E form. If we quickly go through the form briefly to give you an idea of what you can expect, we can see that it is split into parts A, B, and C, with each part having a different owner to fill out. You as a member will only need to fill out part B. If we head over there, we can see that you have to provide information about yourself, your NHS pension scheme membership number, GP information, provide a detailed description of your NHS career and any trainings you have done, and a section on the declaration. The rest of the form will be carried out by your employer and medical officer. Now the process length can vary, but can take between one to three months before a decision is made and your pension is paid out shortly after. So please do take this into account when going into this. There is also likely to be a fair bit of back and forth of exchanging information and extra evidences. So whenever you are requested for these items, be sure to provide them at your earliest to avoid any further delays. Once done, you should receive a notification of your pension benefit amount and when you can expect your first payment to be. Now there can be fees associated when going through this medical assessment. If you are an active member of the NHS pension scheme, it is likely there will be no cost. However, if you are a deferred member, you won't actually have access to the same occupational health service and therefore may be responsible for any fees incurred. And that is the process of how to apply for the NHS pension via ill health retirement. Cool, so that is how you can apply for your NHS pension. If you do have any questions, of course, please do let me know in the comment section down below and remember to like and subscribe. See you later, bye. bye.